book I just did with E.J. Dion and Tom Mann, which is called One Nation After Trump, A Guide for the Perplexed, the Disillusioned, the Desperate, and the Not Yet Deported, <laughs> which includes <laughs> almost everybody now. Uh, and I will give bad news and uh, good news. Uh, so the bad news. If you go through a checklist of a movement towards authoritarianism, uh, we can uh, see a lot of things that we could check off right now. Uh, the first is when you get attacks on the free press. And when you have a president who says that the press is the enemy of the people, a phrase originated by Stalin that Khrushchev, when he became premier of the Soviet Union, said he would not use because it's too dangerous <laughs> and now has been resurrected by Donald Trump. And we see attacks on the press uh, for fake news uh, and for other things on a daily basis. Check that off. Uh, attacks on an independent judiciary. And uh, of course, uh, hitting judges, uh, which Trump did before he got elected uh, with the quote unquote Mexican judge, which he has done since multiple times with uh, the uh, uh, travel bans uh, in their various iterations. Uh, not to mention his attacks on the rest of the justice system, uh, including uh, the FBI, uh, check. A cult of personality. I alone can fix it. And then just the other day, I don't need to fill all those positions in the State Department. I'm the only one who matters. I make the policy. And basically telling people that they don't need to worry about the laws because he can deal with that uh, on his own. Uh, blowing up the norms, uh, and uh, we've seen this, of course, in a whole host of ways, uh, and uh, we've seen it from the president, we see it from his uh, cabinet members, and we see it from Congress, and there I'll talk about the next one, which is uh, either attacking or losing the independent legislature. And we have a Congress that has become a joke. We have a kleptocracy, which is another element of authoritarianism. <laughs> And we have it with the president, with his own family. We saw another glaring example of it uh, as he took his trip to Asia, stopped in Hawaii, went to one of his own properties, and his press secretary, spokesman, uh, then did a commercial for his property. Uh, but we see all of that every day. How many hearings has the House or Senate, uh, House and Senate, uh, done on that kleptocracy, much less what we've seen from the dissembling by his cabinet members, uh, and most recently, the Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross with deep ties to uh, Russia, zero hearings uh, on any of that, much less hearings on some of these other elements of a slide uh, towards uh, authoritarianism. When you push nationalism of the blood and soil variety over patriotism of an us versus them, and when you engage in voter suppression. These are all things that you find if you're doing a checklist of a move towards authoritarianism. And they don't occur just overnight. It's a slow but steady slide. Uh, James Fellows of the Atlantic has uh, long had a crusade against using the analogy that I'm about to use, <laughs> which is the frog in the uh, pot of cold water that changes degree by degree until it's too late. And there's a warning sign there that we need to be aware of. Now I'm gonna mention one other area which is uh, not about Donald Trump, not about populism, but is also something that we ought to have a great concern about. And that is a structural bias building in our political system that has it operating and in, will increasingly in a fashion that the framers did not expect. When uh, the political system was set up, we had an electoral college that was set up to screen against a kind of candidate like Donald Trump. But that was because there were gonna be real people, elites, who would be there making sure that somebody who was out of control, not looking at the best interests of the country, without any anchors in reality, what Alexander Hamilton wrote eloquently about uh, Aaron Burr, uh, who would be a breath of fresh air compared to what we have now. Uh, and of course, that part of the Electoral College went away a long time ago. But when the Electoral College was created with its focus on states, the ratio of population between the smallest, uh, largest and the smallest state was 13 to 1. Now it's 70 to 1. 
in, uh, when we first began to look at popular votes in 1824, all the way up through 1996. 172 years, 44 elections, three arguably where you didn't have a clear-cut winner of the presidency who uh, won the popular vote, but only one where it was uh, uh, really starkly clear. One out of 44, the last five, two out of the five. And we can expect more of that because the Electoral College now is tilted very significantly towards smaller and more homogeneous states, not to mention there was an expectation that there would be real competition. And now very few of the states have any significant competition. More significant and more troubling, by 2050 or even earlier, 70% of Americans will live in 15 states. That means 30% of Americans will control 70 senators, and that is enough to override vetoes, to overcome filibusters, uh, to do a whole lot of things. And all of that means, because of course that means the, those states tend to be smaller, more homogeneous, more white as the population shifts, we're going to have a crisis of legitimacy that is not easily dealt with without dramatic constitutional change and we're not going to get that dramatic <coughs> constitutional change. So those are the challenges. And just very briefly, the good news is we have been jolted. Jolted not just because of what Trump is doing and what his <coughs> allies in Congress are enabling, but jolted because the larger slide that we've had towards division in the society, partisan tribalism combined with the growing divide between states and within states between the prosperous metropolitan areas where people are highly educated and where the economy is thriving and less prosperous, less educated rural areas that are struggling, all of those things could have gone on along with the racial divisions as the population shifts to a point of no return. Now I think large numbers of people and groups are aware that we're going to have to do things to try and knit the society together and we've been jolted by this movement towards authoritarianism and whether it's lawyers mobilizing uh, for the travel ban on the immigration front or uh, religious groups stepping up to protect the safety net or public interest groups moving in to try and put some restraint and shore up the independent judiciary uh, and other reform organizations and the civil society groups like Indivisible from the bottom up beginning to mobilize may mean that our larger cultural antipathy away from a democratic society will enable us to move back on track. But you have to stretch a little bit to find that uh, pony in the pile of manure. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, uh, look, I, I am in the camp that uh, we're not yet at the point where we need to be hysterical but I'm certainly in the same camp of people who are really worried about erosion, deterioration. My, my own work is focused on uh, is democratic governance that has failed. Uh, I started out my career working on democratic breakdowns with Juan Linz and Al Stepan and others, and uh, you know saw one of the most uh, long-lasting democracies collapse, and that was the case of Chile, which I wrote a book about. But I um, and uh, so. Uh, you know, I, I really, I really don't. We're not facing fascism yet. We're not facing a breakdown yet. We're not facing a military coup yet. We're not facing. Uh, we fairly have fairly strong institutions. I think we strong have a strong civil society. We're not where where we, where where William Cornwallhauser was when he wrote his book on Ma the politics of mass society, where there, you know the the secondary associations of society have disappeared. Uh, you know, in that sense, I th I think that we're at a point where this. You know, this, we, there's a clarion call out there for us to get our act together and start working on these things. Let me just simply say from, from my own uh, uh, research and then observing what's going on in the United States, I think we face three crises. Uh, we face a crisis of representation. I mean, the crisis of representation stems from the fact that, in fact, you know, we don't have a proportionality of representation. That is that, you know, if the essence of representative democracy is the notion of one person, one vote, uh, in fact, we don't have that proportionality re re reflected. We can see that in the case uh, right now in Wisconsin, where you know, a majority of the voters right there do not have a majority of the representatives. Uh, and so that's a you know, case in, in that regard, the House of Representatives. Norm just mentioned the situation with the Senate. It, 
you know, 1787, it made a lot of sense to create that particular kind of Senate, but then, you know, today, uh, even today, you know, uh, I think it's, the, you know, 17% of uh, the population, you know, gets to close to 50% uh, of the Senate, and, you know, that's cer certainly not represented. Uh, Nebraska has 500,000 voters and has two senators. California has 49 million voters and, you know, has two senators. So it, that when, when, when we do away with the filibuster rule, what we're doing is we're not you know, allowing the, for the minority to be represented in the Senate of the United States. It's for the majority to be represented in the United States, which is a, one of these great paradoxes, I guess, of our, our, our representative system. And then if you move down, uh, it, you know, if you move over to the executive branch, here we have a situation where you had a president elected uh, who uh, only twice, in, I guess, in American history had... Uh, fewer popular votes and yet was elected uh, president of the United States. Uh, and so that, you know, leads to this, 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 this problem of, of significant disproportionality. The, the, if there's an electoral crisis, there's also a party system crisis. And the party system, you know, comes in various different forms. One of them, is, of course, is the heightened polarization that we see, you know, that, that it didn't, you know, the statistics are, are several, you know, something like, uh, what is it, uh, 91% of Republicans view Democrats with, uh, with disdain, and 86% and, and of, of Democrats, uh, you know, correspond that. You know, in 1960, children uh, um, uh, were told, you know, parents would not be that worried if their um, a child would marry a Republican or a Democrat, 5%, 4%, something like that. In 1960, you know, or in 2010, 49% of Republicans would be very upset if, you know, their child married a, uh, a Democrat, and 33% uh, of Democrats would uh, say the same thing. So what you have is, you know, uh, 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 a worsening in, this, in this, what you might call the politics of identity surrounding these. But ironically, at the same time, with increasingly weak party systems. So these are party systems that are not strong parties. You know, they're parties that are fragmented. Uh, we see it. It's, they're made up of independent political entrepreneurs. Uh, campaign finance is an issue, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's kind of the first crisis, is the crisis of representation. The second is a crisis of governance. And the crisis of governance, you know, in the United States, one of the, I've looked at this very carefully because uh, I've dealt mainly with democracies that are multi-party systems. The United States, fundamentally worked, and Woodrow Wilson understood this, and, and, in, and in fact, Madison himself understood this. Uh, 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 not when he wrote the Federalist Number 10, but later uh, he understood that, in fact, the parties wind up becoming the essential sort of bridges between uh, the institutions of, of the, of the that are based on the doctrine of separation of powers. It's the, the parties that allow that. And in American history, uh, the, 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 with the evolution of a two-party system, there are really only four presidents uh, in, you know, all the way up until the second half of the 20th century that did not have majorities of their parties in, 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 in Congress. This, this business of divided government is a fairly recent phenomena uh, in American history, uh, and it's led to significant difficulties, you know, and, and, and we've had several crises, uh, impeachments and various other things like that, or quasi-impeachments, uh, uh, and yet somehow this, uh, this divided government has still worked in part because you had moderates, I wouldn't call them the vital center that Schlesinger referred to because they, that's a misinterpretation of Schlesinger's views on that, but there were, all few, there were moderates in the situation that would actually keep things going. And then you had, at the same time, you had uh, presidents that could really sort of work the system. And, you know, I took a course at Columbia with uh, Richard Neustadt, who went on to, to found the Kennedy Center at Harvard, and he was still one of the great scholars on presidentialism. And his little book, Presidential Power, says two things. What is presidential power? Presidential power is the power to persuade. It's the power to persuade. And what does the power to persuade re require? Enormous political skills. You have to be able to really be able to, to, to govern. You have to know what po politics is. It's not about making a deal. It's about how you uh, work the, the, the political system. And secondly, uh, presidential power is directly and proportionally related to the <coughs> degree of popularity of the president. The more popular the president, the more po po possibility of power to persuade. Think of the president that we have right now, who does not have any political skills. You know, it's not the art of the deal. Uh, and uh, at the same time, of course, has the lowest uh, levels of popularity of any president in, what, 70 years now uh, at this particular sure. point? And so, uh, you know, so, so here you have a situation that, that, that w which, which really goes to 
to the to the governance. And then I'd like to sort of repeat a concern that that uh, that Norm expressed too, and that is, and I've seen that in the in, in, in my study of the Chilean case, the abdication of the moderates, the abdication of the Democrats, the people who think, oh well, I'm not going to mess around with this at this particular point. I'm not going to stand up right now. I have particular interests that I need to worry about. I have to worry about my primary election coming up, and I'm not going to then stand up and you know do anything about that. And that, that is extremely uh, difficult. In fact, Lynch says the abdication, uh, you know, in this work on the breakdown of democracy, one of the most difficult situations comes up when you have an abdication of the Democrats who decide that they're not going to really defend the system for particularistic kinds of reasons. And uh, finally, you know, I'm uh, I, on this for the, the third crisis is the crisis of the rule of law, perhaps. Uh, and here, uh, we still need to, uh, to, to be a, a bit careful. We're not really where, where, where situations are like in Venezuela and other places where you know, the, the Supreme Court has been taken over by the president and things like that. But you know, let's be careful. This is one of the other lessons that you get out of these uh, cases of study of breakdown. Breakdowns occur when the moderates abdicate, but the breakdowns also occur when the fundamental institutions of governance that are supposed to be that neutral institutions are politicized. And by that we refer to the courts, of course, uh, above all, but also perhaps to the armed forces. You know, the biggest mistake that Allende made in Chile uh, was because there was such a polarization in the country, uh, the, you know, the coup finally takes place in September of 1973, but the opposition was criticizing him so much because he was be too radical. So what does he do? He appoints the commanders in chief of the armed forces to his cabinet to provide for a neutral buffer. And what did that accomplish? It just made those institutions far more vulnerable to, to politicization and to, uh, and to becoming involved in the political fray. Uh, so, and think about other institutions of governance such as central banks. That is, in the United States, the Federal Reserve. I mean, what, at what point do we need to worry about the politicization that leads us to in a different direction? So as you can see, I am worried about significant erosion right here. I don't think we are close to a breakdown. But, if, but unless we hear the clarion call of being careful about what is going on with our institutions, and here I'm, I'm stressing institutions, not just the culture wars. It's the institutional makeup of our system that needs to be in fact, seriously addressed. Um, so thank you. I think there were a couple of things that came out from each of your comments here. Um, some key things that you guys seem to see as the most significant risks that are happening. One is the kind of vulnerability of the party system. It's loss of popularity, legitimacy, strength. Um, which is something that I certainly found very striking when I wrote about this from a kind of comparative perspective, I noticed that different countries have different vulnerability to populist candidates depending on their candidate selection strategy, their rules, the strength of their political parties. Um, and so in the United States, it seems like there is both a political and an institutional element to that. Um, and then the other theme that I heard in one way or another from each of you is this kind of issue of rising polarization that um, we are seeing le a lessening of the norms of cooperation, a lessening of the norms of bipartisanship, and um, an increase in the idea that politics is kind of a team sport. Um, and I think that that plays into some of the geographic issues that you talked about as well, because as the party's support bases become more geographically separated, um, that partisan polarization has a bigger impact on the electoral college. So I think that one thing that I'm very curious about is when all this began. So right now this issue is getting a lot of attention because people are concerned about what is happening here and also in Europe um, with the last few elections that there have been you know, strands of populism having various levels of success in several different countries. Um, but if we're, the, if we're talking about the frog in the kind of pot of water, when did the heat start turning up? What started these, these two fundamental issues of polarization and kind of party 
So uh, I, we can't spend a lot of time on the uh, history, uh, or we could take hours, but go to uh, Newt Gingrich getting elected to Congress in 1978. And I met Newt right after he came to Washington. I set up a series of uh, dinners with members of the class of 78. Um, and uh, we met every six or eight weeks. And uh, we had quite a group of people for a midterm election uh, as freshmen. So we had Newt uh, Gingrich along with Dick Cheney and Geraldine Ferraro and some others. And from the get-go, Newt stood out. He said, 24 consecutive years of Democrats in the majority in the House, I got to change it. I've got to change it by nationalizing the election process instead of having individual incumbents win on their own because they've got more incumbents and their incumbents have more money and it's a slide we can't uh, prevent. And we have to delegitimize Washington and Congress so that voters turn out and say, it couldn't be more awful than this and throw the ins out and bring the outs in. And 16 years uh, of effort, he tribalized politics, radicalized his own party, used the ethics process as a wedge to criminalize policy differences, and recruited a large group of people who really believed that Washington was evil and that you needed to blow up government. Then turn to a series of things that happened. The Fairness Doctrine was repealed in 1987. Now, a lot of people saying we need to bring it back. You can't bring it back in a media world that we have now. But right after that, Rush Limbaugh, who had been a, an obscure noontime radio host in Sacramento, moved to New York to get a national audience and then we had the last wave of populism. The pay raise, 25% for members of Congress and other public officials, an enormous public reaction against it. And Rush became a national figure that started tribal talk radio, which moved into tribal cable television. And, if, and then uh, we have it amplified by social media. You put all of those things together, then have it blown up again by the populism following the bailouts in 2008. And what you've got is parties now, you can't say that they're weaker. In some ways, they're stronger. And our parties have been behaving like parliamentary parties in some ways, not with perfect unity, but close enough. And yet, what we also have is the inability of the parties to control presidential nominations and we have a country now dominated by negative partisanship. And it gets back to what Arturo was saying. People vote up because those on the other side are no longer worthy adversaries. They are the enemy trying to destroy our way of life. And if, uh, it becomes a uh, toxic brew that makes it very difficult to govern in a system that is not a parliamentary system. I'd mention one other thing. Remember when Reince Priebus did his famous autopsy after the Republicans lost with Mitt Romney in 2012. And it was, we are becoming racially divided and we are going to be in the minority unless we can reach out more broadly and immigration is the way to do that. That same Reince Priebus then becomes the chief of staff to a president who is deliberately dividing on racial grounds and a party that has blown up anything having to do with immigration in a positive way and is, in fact, and was especially true under the sadistic head of the Department of Homeland Security named John Kelly, who is now the chief of staff, uh, basically uh, going after people, including a young girl with cerebral palsy taken out of the hospital. You put those things together and you do not have a good picture for our parties. So Sherry, I'm wondering if you might have something to add though based on your study of what's been going on in Europe because Europe didn't have a Newt Gingrich, um, they didn't have a Rush Limbaugh, but populism has also been on the rise there. You know, Marine Le Pen in France mm. just had her strongest showing ever. Um, the French mainstream parties also collapsed in that election. Um, and around Europe, even though there hasn't been the same level of success necessarily, these parties are growing. Um, and they're growing in popularity and they're growing in their influence on the national debate? So, I mean, I think that's an excellent question because as important as someone like Gingrich is, um, it is also really important to recognize that these trends are cross-national. And if we look cross-nationally, particularly in the West, we can see that starting in the 70s, you begin to see a real breakdown in kind of traditional party systems, traditional political dynamics, 
In Europe, because we don't have a first-past-the-post system in most of those countries, that is to say a majoritarian type of system where you end up with two parties, you began to see party fragmentation at this time. That is to say the two main parties, center-right and center-left, began to lose voters and you began to see the rise of new parties. And so manifestations of discontent in Europe tended to come via the formation of new parties. In the United States, they tended to come via insurgents within parties. So then the question is, well, why? What is it about the 70s that causes breakdowns cross-nationally? And I think if we are you know, pretty careful, we can understand precisely what was going on. It's in the 70s that the growth that we had come to take for granted for 30 years um, in the West begins to break down. That is to say that kind of post-war economic order that delivered pretty standard, pretty high rates of growth for three decades begins no longer to be able to do that. And also many of the social changes that had begun to percolate in the 60s really begun to take form in the 70s. In Europe, this is of course also aggravated by rising immigration. In the United States, this is aggravated for many people by the increasing mobilization and empowerment of minority groups. And so in the 70s, you begin to see really across the West signs of backlash against traditional parties. And the underlying reasons for this, again, are the same, the kind of breakdown of a social, the post-war social order and the post-war economic model. And so you begin to see this happen in different ways, but I think it's very important to see Gingrich, right, his ability to do that, his ability to kind of exploit discontent as, a, of course, reflecting particular American, a particular American context, but part of this larger cross-national phenomenon of the old order, that is to say the post-war order breaking down, and changes being set in motion that I think by the early 21st century would lead us to, to the point where we now have populist politicians and parties in very significant um, positions of power really across the West. Not necessarily in government, but significant enough actors to have their views considered, to often be considered as um, partners in coalition governments, and certainly to play an extremely significant role in agenda setting. So I think we see, again, sort of somewhat similar trends across the West with different manifestations depending on the particular rules and dynamics of different democratic political systems. Yes, I, what I would add to that, and I agree with the, the analysis, is in some ways I'd go back a little bit further, and that is that with the end of the Cold War, you really do get, you know, sort of, the, in a sense, the collapse of these two utopias and the struggle. You get uh, middle uh, parties such as the Social Democrats deciding what is it that you, we're all about, really. You have Willy Brandt's <laughs> Bad Godesburg, where he, you know, essentially gives up uh, Marxist-Leninism. Uh, Felipe Gonzalez does the same thing, and you know, so you get the third way uh, sort of social democrats, uh, and that's where you have Tony Blair and uh, Bill Clinton and so on and so forth, and they sort of occupy this sort of middle, but you've lost some of that mystique that was out there that of the ideological sort of fervor of, of the past, and in that sense, the parties begin to lose what their programmatic content really is, and this has an effect all over the, uh, the place. It's just aggravated over a period of time, you know, and the, the danger then, of course, then becomes, you know, some people say, well, we can answer the problems of, of uh, economic distress and so on and so forth, and these aren't the traditional parties. The parties stink. The, 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 the legislatures are terrible. You know, it's a sort of an anti-politics argument. And by the way, presidents, and here I take a leaf out of Latin America, pick up that same argument. Who are some of the people that that, 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 are, that, are, that are most damaging against representative institutions are presidents who are saying, look, it's not my problem, it's the Congress that doesn't do its job, right? It's the parties that don't do its job. Look for me. And so then, you know, in elections, who you get? A whole bunch of independents that suddenly appear. You know, there are 40 in Mexico or something like that right now, uh, you know, running for office because people then want a savior, and that's me, because I'm smarter than anybody else. I guess I have a, I'm sorry. You. Oh, no, I was actually about to ask you this. I guess I have a, 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 a more skeptical view of scholars and pundits' ability to identify the causes of the, the, the shift that we're, I think we're all describing. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm skeptical on a couple of grounds. So, so on the one hand, I'm skeptical that the, that the American party system up through 1970 was some sort of uh, model to be emulated, that the American party system um, up through certainly the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act was one characterized by substantial numbers of elected national representatives who were vocally and persistently committed 
uh, economic and racial stratification. And it was a form of economic and racial stratification that plainly has echoes in the, the mobilization and the form that the Republican Party takes today. So that but was actually to something, sorry, just to interrupt you, pause you there for a sec, because this was actually something I wanted to ask you, um, which is, is it, do you think that the kind of crisis that we're seeing now, or many people are seeing now, might actually just be an extension of the 1960s kind of breakup of the Democratic Party as it was constituted then over civil I, rights? I, I think anyone who tells you, gives you a monocausal, a single cause explanation of events today is peddling uh, something. I, I, I just don't think that that's plausible. The other, so just to, just to put on the table, the other reason that I have for being skeptical of, I think, the story that Sherry was telling, which I think accurately identifies the, the beginning of the 1970s as an inflection point, not just in terms of, of changes to GDP, but as uh, economists like Piketty have identified, changes in the distribution of GDP and changes in the relative ability of different tranches of the electorate as divided by economic, uh, by economic class to, uh, uh, to obtain the policies they want. This is the, the Larry Bartels literature that, that I that I would hope many people are familiar with, right? That's, there, is a, there is a phase shift in the, in the early 1970s, and it might do something toward explaining uh, the phenomena that we see today, along with the shifting dynamics of cultural and racial capital that are, dis, that are unique to the United States. But remember that the rise of populist, quasi-authoritarian, uh, uncompetitive democracies is not a European or American thing alone, right? So as Arturo has said, there is a, a Latin American story which is distinct and occurs along a different time scale. There are stories that in, in Russia, right, which, have, which, which are not particularly related to the story that we've been telling. There's a story in Turkey where the slice of the population that votes for the AK party and that provides Erdogan with the backbone of electoral support is the rising petty bourgeoisie. It is the economically successful slice of the population. The same is true in India, right, which is on the, on the first couple of steps of the same path as Turkey is. But again, it is a rising petty bourgeoisie that is economically successful, that is nonetheless committed to a form of democratic politics that is antithetical or that uh, adopts institutional changes and policies that are antithetical to liberal democratic constitutional democracy, right? So I think that the stories here are way more complicated and way more varied than uh, a single causal explanation allows. So uh, let me just uh, reflect on some of the things that Aziz said. Um, uh, and he's right, there's certainly no single cause. Uh, anybody who would go back and say that the 1950s were wonderful uh, would probably be wearing a Make America Great Again uh, hat. Um, or that the political system was a perfect one. On the other hand, uh, in 1954, uh, the Supreme Court voted unanimously across a very wide ideological divide for Brown versus Board of Education. They took two years to make that decision because they knew it would be an earth-shaking one and they did not want to have it divided. I am quite confident that today's Supreme Court would vote 5-4 if the same thing came up the wrong way. Uh, so there are changes that are very troubling uh, changes uh, that have occurred in the political system. Now you could use an, uh, the analogy of the racial divisions that occurred before we got uh, civil rights uh, laws. Um, but when people ask me about analogies to today, um, the first one obviously that comes up, which is the most troubling, is the period right before the Civil War. Uh, but what I would say is Reconstruction. And that gets to some of the other things that Aziz was talking about. Growing economic inequality and working class, and it's absolutely the case that in, uh, if we look at Trump's supporters, they weren't just white working class voters. They also included a substantial share of educated and well-to-do people who are tribal Republicans right now. But in Reconstruction, you had poor white sharecroppers with uh, blacks who had been freed from slavery and were struggling as well. And then you had a small group of economic elites who were exploiting them both 
and there was an enormous opportunity to have the mass join together with their own interests against those elites, and the elites deliberately used race to divide, and we are suffering the consequences of that ever since, and we are seeing in some ways a new reconstruction. Yeah, I just wanted to add, uh, I mean, I agree that, I mean, Newt Gingrich's role really was, uh, you know, as you pointed out, uh, quite uh, determinative in sort of changing some of the, but, but uh, uh, you know, as others have said, this goes way back, and I'd like just simply like to say, it's, the change really comes, not only, w well, it started with, a, with the Democratic Convention in, in, in 1948, when, yeah. uh, when uh, Hubert Humphrey yeah, stood Humphrey. up, and, and when the, you know, after the, uh, the Truman administration, you know, the, the armed forces are integrated, and, and so on and so forth, and then there's this demand for civil rights, and, and Strom Thurmond leaves uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Dixiecrats are formed, but then the key turning point is after the Civil Rights uh, Act is, and the Voting Rights Act are approved in 64 and 65, thanks in great measure to the Republican Party, because if it hadn't been for ever McKinley Dirksen and those people, we would not have got that. And then what comes next? The Nixon strategy. And the Nixon strategy is, let's pull all those good old boys into the Republican Party. You know, and when they do that, of course, Call then- the Gillespie strategy. That's the Gillespie strategy. In Virginia today, and it was the Nixon strategy uh, back in, you know, uh, at the time that, uh, in, 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 in fact, what you, you, still had the, you still had the chairmanships of all the committees in the, in the Congress with Southern Democrats, but they began to flip over. They began to flip over, you know? When I started my job at Duke University, Jesse Helms was a, a commentator on the radio. Jesse Helms was a Democrat then, you know? Later on, he became a very prominent Republican senator. So you pull then into the Republican Party all of these people. It's still the politics of race. So I just want to um, maybe add a little something to what Aziz and others have said. Um, there's definitely some really important cross-national trends that are going on, but I think it might be a little misleading to conflate things that are going on in places like Turkey or Russia, Hungary, and Poland with what's going on in Europe and the United States. In some ways, you can interpret those former cases as probably relatively predictable cases of um, weak new democracies having significant troubles. I mean, if you look historically, in fact, countries that make transitions for the first time um, almost always have significant democratic backsliding. And so, in fact, we've had less democratic backsliding in this quote unquote third wave than we've had in previous waves. That's not to say it's not important and significant, but I don't think it's kind of surprising that Turkey didn't turn into Sweden overnight or that Hungary and Poland are having significant Backsliding, these are places with really almost no democratic experience whatsoever. What is new, what is historically unprecedented, is the democratic dysfunction and potential backsliding that is going on in countries that have long been considered consolidated liberal democracies. That is to say, Europe and the United States. Now again, there's clearly cross national trends going on here, and as this panel indicates, I think it's quite wise to think about things as broadly and comparatively as possible. But what's historically new, and therefore perhaps most worrying, is that for the first time, again, since the post-war period, we're actually seeing, at the very least, parts of liberal democracy being thrown into question in Europe, and um, probably not Canada, but certainly the United States. And so I think there, we have to look at some slightly different factors than we might when we're looking at cases of democratic backsliding in Latin America, Turkey, Hungary, Poland, and Russia. And there, I think, really, when you look at the cross-national tre trends in the West, the 70s really are a critical inflection point. It's precisely at that time, really, across cases that you begin to see things like party dealignment, increasing dissatisfaction with the political establishment, a growing alienation of voters from traditional political parties and traditional elites, and again, a sort of growing dissatisfaction more generally with the way politics functions. This is a trend that has been building for a long time, but was clearly aggravated by more recent trends like the financial crisis. But this is very much a kind of Western phenomenon um, you know, that I think we, we want to think about as, again, something that is really historically unprecedented as far as consolidated <laughs> liberal democracies undergoing this kind of questioning um, is concerned. I don't want to disagree with that, although I, I, I think I have a slightly different view in, in the following sense. I, I think that, that it's easy to overstate the difference between 
uh, consolidated and unconsolidated democracies along two different dimensions. The first is, uh, in many supposedly consolidated democracies, large slices of the electorate were long kept out of politics, right? So in the United States, that was African Americans at least through the 1965s, mm -hmm. right? So at least through 1965, if you're, if you're character, we like to think of America as a democracy since the get-go, and that's false. It's just false, right? So, so and, the, and there, are, there are somewhat similar stories you can tell in Europe, but not completely analogous. So, but, but, there's, but there's a little bit more variety there than I, 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 than, that, that I would want to, uh, that I would want to, to, to press on. The other thing that I, I think is, is, is important to flag is that the, the older de consolidated democracies tend to have older constitutions. And the older constitutions are ones that don't contain learning about the institutional checks that help consolidate democracy. So there's a sense in which what, one of the things, that, that there's a sense in which newer democracies have a comparative advantage over earlier democracies. That, they, that is, they learn from their mistakes. So, so uh, in Hungary and Poland are actually a very interesting examples here, where you have a, a slate of checking institutions included in their post-Cold uh, War constitutions that have by and large failed. And, and it, it is, I think, interesting and instructive to see why and how those, those fail, uh, especially for us, who have the same checks to the extent that we have them, as matters of statute or norm. So just uh, you know, looking ahead, we had the economic shifts and changes in the 1970s. Uh, there's a piece in the New York Times today about uh, how uh, artificial intelligence is now on the verge of reaching a point where uh, artificially intelligent machines can build even more artificially intelligent machines, and that the programmers are going to be uh, irrelevant looking down the road. Uh, you know, I came over on an Uber, as I do on a regular basis. Those drivers who have formed a new sort of group of independent entrepreneurs will probably be history in five or six years with self-driving cars and their self-driving trucks. The robots now still require some human supervision. Ten years, they may not. We're going to have huge numbers of people, and that goes way beyond working class people who've been promised by Trump that he will keep their jobs from going to Mexico when they're mostly going to robots. But it's also hitting professionals in law firms now as things get moved overseas. But before long, you're not going to need paralegals or others because there'll be machines who could do that for you more efficiently and cheaper. And that will be the case all over the world. And how political systems cope with the fact that Huge numbers of people aren't going to have jobs. And how do you, and a, a small number are going to make a fortune from this. How are you going to deal with that? That's not just the United States, that's China, it's everywhere in the world. The challenges created by rapid technological change are going to be that much greater. And it is entirely possible that the response to that is even more of a tendency towards authoritarianism. Um, so uh, to kind of step back, briefly to something that a couple of you have said um, on this question of how much this is a kind of global phenomenon versus how much these are separate categories. Obviously, every country is different. So you know, we can, I think, all agree on that as a starting point. Um, but one thing that is the kind of core of the populist narrative for any populist politician is always, you know, I alone can save you from a corrupt institution, um, or I alone can save you from this corrupt system. Um, and in some countries, they're promising that to the rising middle class. In some countries, they're promising that to the declining middle class or the poor. It, you know, there's a variety of who they make that argument to. Um, but it seems like it is offering people a, an opportunity and encouragement to place the tribal identity of whatever group it is that is being appealed to over the institutions of democracy and over the kind of norms of democracy, these soft guardrails. Um, and so I wonder from your kind of research and study of this, particularly in Latin America and Europe, what the kind of uh, the post that phenomenon looks like? You know, what happens when populism runs its course? What happens to those kind of tribalized identities and tribalized systems? Do you want to start with Latin America? Sure. Uh, um. You know, one of the one of the ironies about the the when you look at the populists in Latin America that have been successful, so to speak, uh, 
although in most cases they've also destroyed their countries, the case of Venezuela being a dramatic case of this. These are people who have succeeded in getting significant majorities of support. So it's much more dangerous when you have a successful populist who is able to then get majorities in the Congress uh, and then with the majorities in the Congress then push uh, in the other direction. Uh, that's one of the things that we shouldn't worry as much about in the United States where you know, the president again has extremely low uh, popularity uh, uh, rating. So that is, that is a, a phenomenon that, that, that's important. The, um, um, and, and, and the other thing is that they, in most cases they flamed out already. You know, uh, th these have been very bad governments. Uh, these are governments that are essentially, that precisely because they go against the institutions, they wind up ironically destroying the very institutions that elected them to start with and uh, that kept them in office for, for a while. And that's what we've been seeing in Argentina. That's what we've been seeing in, in, uh, in Venezuela. Uh, we still haven't seen that necessarily in, in Nicaragua, but that's a very sm uh, small exception. So beware of majoritarianism and um, um, populism because that's where you know the rule of law and the and the, and the countervailing uh, forces of, of 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 a democratic constitution which which is a restraining constitution and it's a restraining constitution and this is very clear on majorities that's what democratic constitutionalism is is to and, and our founders were very clear about that we don't want the passions of the majorities to overcome so that's why this all the whole notion of checks and balances becomes a really important <coughs> element. Uh, so I, th I think in that sense we don't have to be concerned about that. Uh, in, in one thing though I do, I do want to add because it, it hasn't come up in this. The real scourge in the world today uh, is in fact what the Italians call irredenta. You know, which is irredentist politics, which is, uh, you know, the fact that my community, my identity needs to be sovereign. And, and that phenomena, for example, is not a phenomena of the Western Hemisphere, except for Canada. Except for Canada. And then the whole Quebecois thing has sort of receded somewhat. But, you know, even when you have all these sort of uprisings in Mexico and so on, nobody has said, let's form a Mayan state. In fact, these subalternate loyalties that want to have Sovereign expressions, which is the scourge again of the, of the world today, you know, are still alive and well in Europe, as we see with the Catalonia issue, we, we see with Brexit, and we see with all that kind of thing. Uh, there's, an, there's an irony there. The Americas are the one area of the world where you don't have those kinds of uh, subalternate loyalties uh, fragmenting the politics. In that sense, you know, the uh, development of democratic institutions is probably more promising over the long run, precisely because of that. So, uh, Wait one a of the second. seminal. I think oh, Sherry, did you have something to add? Yeah. I'll wait. Go ahead. Okay. So, one of the seminal moments in the last campaign was when Donald Trump said, and he was addressing the African American community, but it resonated more broadly, what the hell have you got to lose? And uh, I think one bright side here, spot here, may be we're discovering what the hell we've got to lose. And one of the reasons that uh, uh, Geert Wilders and Marine Le Pen performed much more poorly than many expected uh, was a sudden realization that maybe we've got a lot to lose if we move in an extreme direction. And it's possible, at least, that we will see a pendulum swinging back a little bit um, towards maybe somebody who knows what they're doing, maybe a professional. And it may well be, you know, I've, I've often said, we've had long had this sort of uh, fantasy that we could run government like a business. But if you're running it like Trump University, uh, we may rethink things. If we see the world falling apart, the kind of uh, isolationism uh, and the backlash foreign policy that we're seeing with Trump might be replaced by something that has respect for alliances and uh, and an understanding of who the enemies really are. And at the same time, the attitudes of younger uh, people in America, for all these racial divisions, keep in mind we've gone through a sea change in attitudes. People do not see interracial marriage or relationships as uh, an evil thing, which they did 30 or 40 years ago. When we do surveys of younger voters, they don't see race in the same way that we see with uh, older voters.
So you could see some positive signs maybe with generational change and a reaction uh, against uh, inept policies along with uh, uh, the authoritarian ones. Mm -hmm. um, so let me say two things. One to what um, Norm just said. Um, I think it's really important to recognize that both Wilders and Le Pen got their highest vote shares ever. They weren't powerful enough, popular enough to capture governments, but their vote shares have been increasing now again, you know, sort of secularly for many, many elections. I don't think it's very easy to beat something with nothing. I don't think simply their kind of ludicrous behavior and to us somewhat ridiculous policy suggestions are going to be enough to dampen their popularity. They're only going to be defeated if mainstream parties come up with better, more attractive alternatives. And that's where I think I'm somewhat more pessimistic. The second thing I'd like to add goes back to, I think, perhaps your initial question and maybe something that you were um, suggesting we think a little bit more about too, which is that there is, a, there is an important difference historically and intellectually between liberalism and democracy. We conflate them in the West because they've existed together for decades after the Second World War. Historically, they have not gone together. And in fact, I think one of the things we may be very well seeing now is that they are separating again. In the West, at least, populists are not anti-democratic. What they are is profoundly anti-liberal and anti-plural. In fact, they claim, not incorrectly, I think, to be coming in precisely because democracy has ceased functioning. functioning. It is no longer serving its representative function. It is no longer responding successfully to the challenges that societies face. It is ignoring significant groups of disaffected and dissatisfied voters. And the problem is really that democracy needs someone from the outside, like me, not me, but a populist politician to come in and revitalize it. But the way in which that is suggested to be done is profoundly anti-liberal and anti-pluralistic, which we could talk more about. But again, I think it's very important to distinguish those things, right? No populist, no major populist party or politician in the West claims to be against democracy. This is different from autocrats in other parts of the world. It's different from fascists during the interwar period. But what they do really want to do is profoundly change that liberal or pluralistic part that we've thought of incorrectly, for sure, in places like the United States, as being inherently intertwined. And therefore, I think responses to what they're suggesting and what they're feeding off have to be slightly different, again, than in places where democracy itself is being overtly um, thrown into question. Um, yeah, Aziz, if you want to kind of take the last answer, I'm pretty curious about how, within your kind of framework that you've set up for constitutional democracy's decline, what the interplay between democracy and liberalism is within that. So uh, Amanda is referring to an academic paper, uh, which will uh, be a book uh, at some point, uh, which is a luxury that us academics get to say, uh, uh, in which a colleague at the political science department at the University of Chicago and I uh, play through the, the ways in which uh, 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 institutions are, as Sherry rightly said, a distinctive kind of liberal democracy under the rule of law are unraveled. And what we, uh, what we try to show is that there are, there are fairly predictable pathways, uh, and that those pathways are, uh, are copied from one jurisdiction to another, which is, I think, one reason why I see the, the global picture as more salient, perhaps, because I, I see a migration of, of, of policies, uh, of anti-democratic policies from one jurisdiction to another. Um, where uh, one, 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 one way of thinking about what the end point looks like is uh, to look to jurisdictions, actually like Russia, which I think is, is probably, the, uh, for, for, for reasons that we, we now are, are all well acquainted with, one of the leading exporters of both specific and, and, and uh, specific instruments of, of anti-democratic, unraveling, but also a, a, a little bit of a, of a petri dish for the tools of uh, democratic, uh, liberal democratic destabilization. Right? One can look at jurisdictions like Russia and see what it, what, it, what it means to have democracy without the accoutrements of liberalism or the accoutrements of the rule of law. Right? And, and, and I think Russia is the extreme case. I think Hungary is a, is a really interesting intermediate case 
um, in part because Hungary has been economically reasonably successful. And, and so there is, there is a sense in which the, the hollowing out of the state has occurred and the hollowing out of, of democratic practices has occurred um, in a, it, without a considerable degree of public dissatisfaction. Right? Um, and so I, I think that there are clear models out there for uh, what the end, the end game looks like. And, and, and you know, it, it has a lot of the, the bells and whistles of democracy. Uh, whether the groups that were previously excluded from or felt perceived themselves to be excluded from the spoils of national economic success do any better, I think is a very much an open question. Whether they can be persuaded that there are compensating gains in terms of, uh, I mean, in the United States, it would be what, w, uh, uh, what Dubois called the wages of whiteness, right? Whether there are compensating psychic gains that can be had, I think is, is, a, is a very much an open question. Um, and I, 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 I want to fully subscribe also to, to what Sherry described and the diagnosis that she gave. I, I think one point I would elaborate without disagreeing with her is the, the central question for a, a, an opposition coalition that wants to resist democratic erosion is not what cluster of policies to offer. It is rather the problem of ideology. It is rather how can we articulate a, a sense of the nation and a sense of belonging to the nation that reflects uh, the experience of enough people that is a sufficient mirror for enough people that they align themselves emotionally with us. And I think that is a tremendously challenging and difficult political question. Uh, and it's a political question that goes to kind of what I would call the ideological heart of democracies. Um, so I think this is a good moment to break and take some questions from the audience. Um, so we have some people who are going to go around with microphones. Um, yes, you in the pink jacket here, in the second row. Thank you all so much for a really stimulating conversation. One thing that I have not heard you talking about, and I wonder if you would address it, uh, particularly in the American context, I can't talk about it in the cross-national context, but when we talk about the crisis of democracy, what about the educational system and the appalling lack of information, um, not only about government and governmental institutions, but about the nature of democracy on the part of the American electorate? I mean, when you look at the statistics that show the majority of Americans cannot name both of the senators from their state and the vice president and cannot name most of the protections of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. I mean, you're focusing rightly on a lot of institutions, but what about that very basic part of democracy, the electorate, and the way it is being trained for democracy? Is that for a particular panelist or anything? No, who anybody who would like to respond, I would appreciate it. Well, I guess uh, I could say, having uh, spent a fair amount of time trying to work on civic education, that it has been uh, a, an uphill challenge that is growing more uphill. And as we see funding taken away from education, the attempts to expand civic education, uh, much less uh, things like the arts, uh, is going to come under even greater challenge. And what we're also seeing is the partisan tribalism and uh, radical ideologies that have metastasized down to many states are reshaping educational systems as well. The textbooks that people have, the fundamental knowledge about the history of the United States, any focus on the Constitution and science even are being taken away in a number of states. And so what we know has been a, a great challenge of just basic knowledge uh, about how the political system is supposed to work, much less about the people who are in uh, government or running, uh, is going to become greater, not lesser, I'm afraid. Just real quickly, I agree with that. And uh, let me say uh, another thing is slightly different. A lot of people have often emphasized in countries that haven't had very strongly strong democratic traditions. And what you need to do, of course, to develop a culture of democracy 
before you get democracy. And this is where, you know, in the schools and all you had civic education and so on and so forth. Frankly, I think the evidence suggests that that is not necessarily the, the way in which you're going to get democratic institutions coming out because in some ways the school for democracy is democracy itself. In other words, as you struggle to build democratic institutions, that's when you re re are able to be able to teach uh, democracy. This is not something that's done educationally, you know, sort of tabula rasa. You do it, uh, in fact, with the practice of democracy. So the key is to try to build democratic institutions at the same time that you're, you're working to try to teach about democratic institutions. Um, you, sir, uh, in the second row, right here. One of the uh, politicians who's often been named as, uh, as, as a populist authoritarianism, uh, kind of uh, a would-be Trump who didn't quite make it because he was an uh, out-of-control alcoholic, was Senator Joe McCarthy. Uh, but uh, in the late 60s, a scholar named Rogan R-O-G-I-N, wrote a book specifically looking at how comparing the populace of the 1890s to Joe McCarthy, especially in Wisconsin, where their votes came from. And he said there wasn't much uh, uh, overlap at all. And I'm wondering if anybody's familiar with the book and has read it, which I have not. Uh, I only know about it because my graduate school roommate had to do a seminar paper on it. <laughs> I'm not familiar with that particular book, but there has been a, a large amount of research on populism and progressivism in the late 19th and early 20th century. And now we have a picture of those voters and those movements as being way more um, progressive than we used to. That is to say, actually more inclusive, less anti-Semitic than was the norm at the time. Um, and sort of, again, way more influential down the road than we perhaps had previously thought. I mean, one thing I, I actually thought you were going towards, and so perhaps I will, I, I'm putting words in your mouth and, and trying to answer a question you didn't ask, is thinking about the McCarthy era as an era of polarization. That is to say that, you know, what we're experiencing today is certainly something quite important, but it may have some important, um, uh, may have some important, um, antecedents in earlier periods in American history. The 60s were a time, obviously, of immense polarization in many ways over some of the issues we spoke about, and certainly the McCarthy era. And so one thing that we might want to think about is ways in which America ma managed to overcome those previous periods of polarization. The progressive era and populists in the late 19th century actually were, over the long term, quite successful in getting their issues incorporated into um, mainstream American life, which may bring us back perhaps to the point you made about how populism can be salutary under certain kinds of conditions and if existing political actors respond to the issues and challenges that populist movements um, actually bring up. Um, the, back, the back in the purple shirt. Hi, I've heard a lot about all the income inequality and how that's really eviscerating our democracy, and I'd love to hear you all talk about what working people and consumers are going to be able to do to take economic power back when we see the legal system consistently taking those traditional roads away, such as the CFPB rule, consumers can no longer sue the banks. Same thing with mandatory arbitration, which the Supreme Court heard opening day. We have the Janus case coming up, which may eviscerate public sector unions. So how are, we in, the, in the Yale survey that came out, that said all of the tech billionaires are very progressive on many issues except for workers' rights and unions. And so how are working people going to really bridge that income gap if those traditional pathways are taken away from them? So we have a chapter in our book on Trump as the phony populist. And all of the actions being taken by the administration, many, many of them under the radar, while Congress isn't doing very much, uh, what they have been doing is using the Congressional Review Act to blow up regulations. And we see an administration filled with people who are not faithfully executing the law or are finding ways to tilt things away from working people. And that's a great challenge. You know, it's interesting. If you think of Wisconsin as a kind of microcosm, it was the root of uh, progressivism in the 1920s and 30s with La Follette, and then it moved to McCarthy. Then it went to the Gaylord Nelson, Bill Proxmire, uh, and uh, 
uh, Feingold era, and now it's the Scott Walker era, which started by blowing up unions and now has become the laboratory for voter suppression. And all of that says there has to be a different kind of focus. What uh, my co-authors and I have suggested is what really is needed is a focus on the working class, not the white working class, but all working class voters, and a, an agenda that will start to build a, a new, almost a new GI Bill for workers. Uh, and if you can get an agenda out there, at some point it may be possible to implement it. But the fact is, it's going to be a very, very rough time for working people uh, as worker safety is taken away, as consumer protections are taken away, uh, and as their health care is taken away. So I actually just want to press you on that a little bit, and you can follow up as well. Um, it seems like something we've seen time and time again in American politics is that it's very difficult to make class identity more salient than yeah. race or religious identity. Um, and so very often in these conversations, people say like, oh, we need to kind of not prioritize just the white working class. And there's broad agreement about that. But the dynamics of American politics, particularly racial politics, pose real barriers to that. And I wonder if you see any kind of pathways through those barriers becomes, it's, it's an uphill challenge, there's no doubt. And you know that's one reason why I mentioned the new reconstruction, because there are powerful forces that will try and use these things in a different direction. You know, on the other hand, uh, social media can be a positive force as well as a, a divisive and negative force. And we're seeing it now with uh, sexual harassment. It's just changed. And that includes in Silicon Valley, where presumably progressive organizations are turning out to be among the most misogynistic uh, that we have. And there's a backlash. And it's possible, at least, I think, both to devise a set of policies, but also to begin to promote them more aggressively in a fashion that is not so divisive. But I'm not going to uh, be a Pollyanna here and say that uh, the outcome is inevitable or is anything but a seriously uphill battle. Did you have something you wanted to add on that? Yeah, so quickly, the, the question reminds me of discussions that I had when I was growing up in the 1980s in England, where there, were, there was this pressing question on the, on the left of what on earth are working class people doing voting for Margaret Thatcher, who is dismantling the welfare state, dismantling education, dismantling access to universities that enable, and grammar schools that enable people to make their way out of the working class. And the, the mistake that I, I now see in those discussions is the, is the assumption that people identify with their economic interests. And the assumption that I, I take it that the question comes from the left, but the assumption from the left that one doesn't have to do the hard work of creating a sense of political identity, right? That it comes kind of prepackaged, right? Um, and, and I think you can, in some fashion, make this critique of the Clinton campaign, right? Which I know is not, by many people's standards, the left. Um, but it, 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 it was a campaign built around, as many people have noticed, policies. Many, many, many policies. And it articulated no understanding of what, it, of what, uh, of what our, our shared interests are, are right? And, and to my mind, that challenge, which, hey, look, I'm an academic, I'm a lawyer. I, I don't know anything about talking to people. Um, but that, to me, is the really, really tough challenge in the immediate term. I, I, I actually think the, the institutional challenges and the, the kind of the, the big structural challenges, you only get to those if you solve that first problem. Yes, you, sir, in the third row there. Ian Milheiser with uh, Think Progress. Um, Aziz, you, you'd mentioned that we really didn't become a liberal democracy since, s until 1965. I agree with that. There's a profound uh, thread of racial illiberalism in the United States. There's also a competing thread of illiberalism. There's an economic illiberalism that was ascended in the early 20th century where if a state tried to pass any kind of law that benefited workers, the courts would strike it down on some novel theory. 
And two things have happened uh, now. One is that both the racial liberalism and the economic liberalism, which often operated in independent political spheres for most of our history, have now united under the same partisan banner, and that is new and I think possibly unprecedented in American history. Um, the other thing that, it, that, that has happened is that you're seeing the locus of innovation amongst uh, the conservative um, forces in the country shifting from the elected branches to the judiciary. So you're, you're not, you know, as one person mentioned in the back, like Congress can't pass anything, but we can dismantle our civil rights laws either by, you know, through things like Ledbetter or through things like arbitration where you can't enforce the law even if you have the right anyway. Um, and, and so what my, I guess what my question is, is we have these two threads that we've seen throughout. Um, we live in a world now where the party that has united under the thread, uh, 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 under a white nationalist leader now, recently had five of its unelected officials dismantle part of the law that allowed us to become a liberal democracy. And we're two su Supreme Court vacancies away from returning to the 1920s. Why should we view the moment we're in now as a backslide from uh, an established liberal democracy and not simply as a reversion to norm. Is that a question to me or? Uh, for Pam. Okay, well, I don't need to, or I can answer. Uh, so I, 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 I think I agree with the, the ultimate conclusion that uh, if, if one is going to assess backsliding, it has to be against a, a relatively short period from the 19, from about 1965 onward. Um, I, I, I disagree uh, in, a, in a couple of ways, I, although I think helpful and productive ways. Uh, so the first is I, I think I would trace the connections between capitalism uh, as, or, or, or economic liberalization in your terms and the kind of forces of cultural reaction much earlier, right? Uh, and, and I would look to the work of historians like Kevin Cruz who have identified the, the ways in which in particular, religious conservatives and economic liberals found common cause early in the, early in the 20th century, right? I, I also think that, there's the, that I would not place emphasis on the Supreme Court in the, in the, in the first part of the 20th century as, all, as, as a pivotal actor in the way that you do. I, I think far more important was the concerted campaign that was carried out with some acquiescence by the courts, but where the courts were, were we're, we're secondary partners to, to eliminate communist or socialist uh, uh, parties and strains within the United States from the 19 teens and 20s onwards, right? So, so one, uh, the, 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 the United States is a country where, the, where the, the, the harder left has been systematically suppressed since roughly the period in which it emerges in other European democracies as a, as a, very, as a, as a relatively vital force. So but that, I think that's sympathetic in the sense that it's adding to your skepticism about the pre-1965 uh, 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 dispensation. Um, yeah. Thank you all, this is so interesting. Uh, Mr. Valenzuela was talking about how dangerous it can be to have a populist leader uh, who has majoritarian support. I'm actually quite concerned about the dangers of having a populist leader who is, whose support is failing and is very, very low, uh, particularly when that leader is also potentially under investigation for obstruction of justice, uh, there's already talk of, of impeachment, and that leader desperately needs a distraction that is not only going to uh, reinforce his popularity, uh, but is going to enable him to consolidate power. Um, and what are the chances that this president will not start a major war? And if that happens, what does that bode for the resilience of our institutions that have thus far been withstanding the pressures um, that this sort of populist wave has put on them? Uh, if I might make a, a comment along these lines, I actually uh, served in the State Department in the first Obama administration as the Assistant Secretary for the Western Hemisphere, and, and then in the, in, in the Clinton White House also uh, in the second term at the National Security Council. So some of my work has been really been focused on, on international affairs. I am a deeply worried about the fact that uh, 
uh, a president does have a certain kind of latitude um, in international affairs, particularly having to do with issues of, of the codes and so on and so forth, uh, and that somehow there could be some kind of a, uh, uh, and I'm not totally reassured that by stacking the administration with a series of former military people or of current military people that somehow you're going to get the kind of necessary correctives to that sort of thing. Quite the contrary, I'm a little wor worried about the, the, that dynamic. So I share your, your concern that there, there, the, the damage that this administration, I am less worried about the damage that this administration is making to domestic politics, although they're very serious for all the reasons that, that have been expressed. Uh, I'm really worried about the, 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 the sort of vacuum that the United States is leaving internationally and the mistakes that the United States could very well make internationally uh, you know, to, to reverse uh, you know, what has been essentially a, a US-led effort that goes way back to try to create a rules-based uh, international uh, system where international institutions count and are, are so. Uh, now, the other part of your question, I will let, let maybe some of my colleagues answer it. You know, uh, I would hope that Mr. Mueller can continue with his work, you know, and I think that everybody should, uh, you know, the, the fundamental part of the rule of law there is, is can that actually succeed? We have to address the uh, large elephants in the room, which are two worst case scenarios. One is a, a war, and what we have to keep in mind is that the system presupposes that you have a president who's kind of normal. There is a, uh, it, it is, uh, we were not built to have a, a narcissistic sociopath as a president. And the power to use nuclear weapons is his alone. And we know that you've had the generals at least talking amongst themselves about how they might have to tackle him. That's a fear. My fear at the moment is that as Mueller gets closer, we will have a president who uh, goes through the Justice Department and finds somebody to fire him and everybody around him and then pardons himself along with everybody else, and then goes on Fox and Friends and says, this is a coup attempt. I was elected fair and square, and Hillary Clinton and the deep state are trying to steal this election back, and I will not let it happen, and I want all of my supporters to go to the streets and keep it from happening. And maybe that's not a likelihood at this point, but if we dismiss it as very, very unlikely, we're making a big mistake. Have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> With that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know who the was. Just cut right we, it have, we can do one more. The guy more. at the back. Yeah, we can take a question back there. Thank you. My name is Yaya Fanusi with the United States of Africa 2017 Project Task Force. I'm going to do what I do with my professors all these years when I studied for my first degree, second degree, and my PhD. I want you all there, and also the listeners, that, that go study what was happening in organi organizational theory, analysis, and behavior in the 60s and 70s where corporations in the private sectors had to confront radical, unpredictable chaos and change, and then apply it to what you all are facing now, not just in America, but in the different world, about the attack or all these things that are coming out that you all do not see happening. Because you sit in there, and the two professors have not done a proper conceptual analysis and to see, to submit everything you're talking under change, rapid, unpredictable, unforeseen change, and let's see how the political leaders and political institutions will try to cope or adapt like private corporations did when they were facing this in the 60s and 70s. I have a PhD in this field, I was a professor. So if I understood correctly, the question was whether we are seeing rapid and unpredictable change that government institutions are struggling to respond to quickly enough. Um, does anyone want to? Well, I, I mean, I think that that's, that's absolutely a, a, great, um, a great sort of sketch of precisely what we've been facing in the West for the last several decades. I mean, capitalism. Markets have been changing dramatically. That's not your question. 
So you you have a suggestion rather than a question. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. So okay. It, yeah, it's a suggestion rather than a question. All right. Well, I mean, I think we would probably all differ. I think actually that is as complicated and challenging as the problems that corporate leaders have faced. I actually think, and maybe I'm prejudiced because I'm a political scientist. I think the challenges facing governments and other political institutions are at a level of complexity really, really way beyond that. And I think that is definitely part of the disorder and decay that we have been experiencing, namely that we have been facing some really significant changes both economically and socially over the last decades. And I think our political institutions have not done a great job of responding to them. And I think that is a significant part of the populist challenge and decay. I'm not sure what kind of lessons we could learn from corporations, but perhaps that's because I'm not a I don't have a PhD in corporate behavior, but, um, but I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily transfer problems and responses from one field to the other, although there, you know, there's generally something that can be learned um, you know, pretty much from anywhere. You know, I, I guess, uh, very quickly, the, I, at least since the early 1970s, as Sherry earlier said, capital has captured a much larger share of rents, economic rents, than uh, than labor. And that, that's evidence of, of, of a kind of success. Um, but it's a success that I, I, I think, in, in some part, has led to the dysfunctions and the difficulties of democratic politics that we've been describing. And, and so, so I, the dis, there is a disanalogy between capitalists and governments in the sense that, the, that a company, unlike a state, does not have to internalize all of the costs of its uh, operation, it can it can externalize them as they have successfully done over the last three decades. Mm. States can do that too sometimes, pretty That's successfully. True. That's true. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, so, in the very back there, the glasses. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Avram Reisman. I'm an MA candidate at the uh, Georgetown Democracy and Governance Program, um, and. I guess my question is that, um, so being in that program, I'm, I'm kind of steeped in uh, political development theory right now, and uh, we read Sam Huntington recently, and I have to say that a lot of what's, uh, a lot of the way you describe the divide between the uh, rural and urban communities uh, and uh, the fact that one is very, is more prosperous and educated, it sounds a lot like the Green Uprising, which uh, Huntington, of course, uses to describe, uh, you know, this post-democratic uh, or post-modernization change. But I guess what I wonder is, without proper institutionalization, with the failures of institutions, whether uh, that's kind of what we're seeing now as well. Can I answer? Because I love Sam Huntington. Great. So um, I think, presuming that you're talking about political order, I mean, the basic argument that he makes here is that there's actually, when you want to understand whether you get political order and political decay, you have to look both at the challenges being faced and at the ability of institutions to respond to them. So it would be wrong simply to look at the absolute level or depth of challenges, right? Because the kinds of challenges that can be handled well, let's say, by Canada, cannot be handled well by Somalia. So the other part of the equation is how flexible, adaptable, and effective your institutions are. And I think maybe to kind of sum up some of the points I was trying to make, perhaps somewhat unsuccessfully during the earlier parts of this conversation, is I think what we're facing today is, is something that's going on on both ends of that Huntingtonian equation, right? Which is, I do think, in the West, that we have faced significant economic and social challenges over the past several decades, immense amounts of change, right? Much more so in both of those spheres, I think, than in the 30 post-war golden years. But I also think there's been a significant decay in the ability of our institutions to respond to them. And I think that combination has proved, has produced rather precisely as Huntington would predict, a significant amount of disorder and decay. So I think we need to look at both parts of that equation. The part that we can influence, I think, probably most directly are the institutions and figuring out ways to make them more responsive, more re flexible, more adaptable, so that they are better able to deal with what are the really significant challenges that I think societies in the West face today. Anyone else? OK, well, that seems like a pretty great point on which to wrap things up. Um, thank you so much to the panelists. This has been a really fascinating discussion.